Part 8 Nothing had changed in the appearance of the family, except that the wife and daughters had opened the package and put on the woolen stockings and underclothes. Two new coverlids were thrown onto the, over the beds. Jondrette had evidently just come in. He had not yet recovered his regular breathing. His daughters were sitting upon the floor near the fireplace. His wife lay as if exhausted upon the pallet near the fireplace, with an astonished countenance. Jondrette was walking up and down the garret with rapid strides. His eyes had an extraordinary look. The woman, who seemed timid and stricken with stupor before her husband, ventured to say to him, What really? You were sure? Sure. It was eight years ago. But I recognise him. Oh, I recognise him. I recognised him immediately. What? Did it not strike you? No. And yet I told you to pay attention. But it is the same height, the same face, hardly any older. There is some maybe who do not grow old. I do not know how they do it. It's the same tone of voice. He's better dressed, that is all. Ah, mysterious old devil. I've got you. All right. He checked himself and said to his daughters, You, go out. It is queer it did not strike your eye. The two girls went out. Just as they were passing the door, the father caught the elder by the arm and said with a peculiar tone, You will be here at five o'clock precisely, both of you. I shall need you. Marius redoubled his attention. Alone with his wife, Jondrette began to walk the room again and took three or four turns in silence. Then he spent a few minutes in tucking in the bottom of the women's chemise which he wore into the waist of his trousers. Suddenly, he turned toward the woman, folded his arms and exclaimed, And do you want I should tell you one thing? The young lady. Well, what? said the woman. The young lady? Marius could doubt no longer. It was indeed of her that they were talking. He listened with an intense anxiety. His whole life was concentrated in his ears. But Jondrette stooped down and whispered to his wife. Then he straightened up and finished aloud. It is she. That girl, said the wife. That girl, said the husband. No words could express what there was in the that girl of the mother. It was surprise, rage, hatred, anger, mingled and combined with, in a monstrous intonation. The few words that had been spoken, some name doubtless, which her husband had whispered in her ear, had been enough to rouse this huge drowsy woman to change her repulsiveness to hideousness. Impossible, she exclaimed, when I think that my daughters go barefoot and have not a dress to put on. What? A satin palace? A velvet hat? Buskins and all? More than two hundred francs worth? One would think she was a lady. No, you are mistaken. Why, in the first place, she was horrid. This one is not bad. She's really not bad. It cannot be she. I tell you, it is she. You will see. And this absolute affirmation, the woman raised her big red and blonde face and looked at the ceiling with a hideous expression. At that moment, she appeared to Marius still more terrible than her husband. She was a swine with the look of a tigress. What? she resumed. This horrible, beautiful young lady who looked at my girls with an appearance of pity? Can she be that beggar? Oh, I would like to stamp her heart out. She sprang off the bed, and remained a moment standing, her hair flying, her nostrils distended, her mouth half open, her fists clenched and drawn back. Then she fell back upon the pallet. The man still walked back and forth, paying no attention to his female. After a few moments of silence, he approached her and stopped before her with folded arms as before. And do you want I should tell you one thing? What? she asked. He answered in a quick and low voice. My fortune is made. The woman stared at him, with that look which means, Has the man who is talking to me gone crazy? He continued. Listen attentively. He has caught the creosis. It's all right. It's already done. Everything is arranged. I've seen the men. He will come this evening at six o'clock to bring his sixty francs, the rascal. Did you see how I got that out? My sixty francs, my landlord, my fourth of February. It's not even a quarter. Was that stupid? He will come then at six o'clock. Our neighbour has gone to dinner then. Mother Burgon is washing dishes in the city. There is nobody in the house. Our neighbour never comes back before eleven o'clock. The girls will stand watch. You shall help us. He will be on his own executioner. And if he should not be his own executioner? asked the wife. Jondrette made a sinister gesture and said, We will execute him. <laughs> and he burst into a laugh. It was the first time that Marius had seen him laugh. This laugh was cold and feeble and made him shudder. Jondrette opened a closet near the chimney, took out an old cap, and put it on his head after brushing it with his sleeve. Now, said he, I'm going out. 
I still have some men to see, some good ones. You'll see how it's going to work. I shall be back as soon as possible. It's a great hand to play. Look out for the house. Marius heard his steps recede along the hall and go rapidly down the stairs. Just then, the clock of Somadad struck one. Part 9 On reaching number 14, Rue de Pontoise, Marius went upstairs and asked for the commissary of police. The commissary of police is not in, said one of the office boys. There's an inspector who answers for him. Would you like to speak to him? Is it urgent? Yes, said Marius. The office boy introduced him to the commissary's private room. A man of tall stature was standing there, behind a railing, in front of a stove, and holding up with both hands the flaps of a huge overcoat with three capes. He had a square face, a thin and firm mouth, very fierce, bushy, greyish whiskers, and an eye that would turn your pockets inside out. You might have said of this eye that it had not penetrated, but it ransacked. This man's appearance was not much less ferocious or formidable than Jondrette's. It is sometimes no less startling to meet the dog than the wolf. What do you wish? said he to Marius without adding monsieur. The commissary of police. He is absent, I answer for him. It is a very secret affair. Speak then. And very urgent. Then speak quickly. This man, calm and abrupt, was at the same time alarming and reassuring. He inspired fear and confidence. Marius related his adventure. The inspector remained silent a moment, then answered between his teeth, speaking less to Marius than to his cravat. There ought to be a dash of patrol minute in this. He relapsed into silence, then resumed. Number 5052. I know the shanty. Impossible to hide ourselves in the interior without the artist perceiving us. Then they would leave and break up the play. They are so modest. The public annoys them. None of that, none of that. I want to hear them sing and make them dance. Marius interrupted him. That is rough enough, but what are you going to do? The inspector merely answered. The lodgers in that house have latch keys to get in with at night. You must have one. Yes, said Marius. Have you it with you? Yes. Give it to me, said Marius. Said the inspector. Marius took his key from his waistcoat, handed it to the inspector, and added, If you trust me, you will come in force. The inspector threw a glance upon Marius, such as Voltaire would have thrown upon a provincial academician who proposed a rhyme to him with a single movement. He had plunged both his hands, which were enormous, into the two immense pockets of his overcoat, and took out two small steel pistols, of the kind called fisticuffs. He presented them to Marius, saying hastily and abruptly, Take these, go back home, hide yourself in your room. Let them think that you have gone out. They are loaded, each with two balls. You will watch, there is a hole in the wall, as you have told me. The men will come. Let them go on a little. When you deem the affair at a point, and when it is time to stop it, you will fire off a pistol, not too soon. The rest is my affair. A pistol shot in the air into the ceiling, no matter where. Above all, not too soon. Wait until the consummation is commenced. You are a lawyer. You know what that is. Marius took the pistols and put them in the side pocket of his coat. As he placed his hand on the latch of the door to go out, the inspector called to him. By the way, if you need me between now and then, come or send here. You will ask for Inspector Javert. Evening had come. Night had almost closed in. There was now but one spot on the horizon where in the whole sky which was lighted by the sun, that was the moon. She was rising red below the low dome of La Salpetriere. Marius returned to number 5052 with rapid strides. The door was still open when he arrived. He ascended the stairs on tiptoe and glided along the wall as far as his room. The hall, it will be remembered, was lined on both sides by garrets, which were all at that time empty and to let. Madame Bourgain usually left the doors open. As he passed by one of these doors, Marius thought he perceived, in the unoccupied cell, four motionless heads, which were made dimly visible by a remnant of daylight falling through the little window. Marius, not wishing to be seen, did not endeavour to see. He succeeded in getting into his room, without being perceived and without any noise. It was time. A moment afterward, he heard Madame Rigon going out and closing the door of the house. Part 10 Marius sat down on his bed. It might have been half-past five o'clock. 
A half hour has only separated him from what was to come. He heard his arteries beat as one hears the ticking of a watch in the dark. He thought of this double march that was going on in the moment in the darkness, crime advancing on the one hand, justice coming on the other. He was not afraid, but he could not think without a sort of shudder of the things which were so soon to take place. To him, as to all those whom some surprising adventure has suddenly befallen, this whole day seemed but a dream. And to assure himself that he was not prey of a nightmare, he had to feel the chill of the two steel pistols in his fob pockets. It was not now snowing. The moon, growing brighter and brighter, was getting clear of the haze, and its light, mingled with the white reflection in the fallen snow, gave the room a twilight appearance. There was a light in the Jondrette den. Marius saw the hole in the partition shine with a red gleam which appeared to him bloody. He was sure that this gleam could hardly be produced by a candle. However, there was no movement in their room. Nobody was stirring there. Nobody spoke, not a breath. The stillness was icy and deep. And save for that light, he could have believed that he was beside a sepulchre. Marius took his boots off softly and pushed them under his bed. Some minutes passed. Marius heard the lower door turn on its hinges. A heavy and rapid step ascended the stairs and passed along the corridor. The latch of the garret was noisily lifted. Jondrette came in. Several voices were heard immediately. The whole family was in the garret, only they kept silence in the absence of the master, like the cubs in the absence of the wolf. A moment afterward, Marius heard the sound of the bare feet of the two young girls in the passage, and the voice of Jondrette crying to them. Pay attention now, one towards the barrier, the other at the corner of the Rue de Petit Banquier. Do not lose sight of the house door a minute, and if you see the least thing, here immediately, tumble along, you have a key to come in with. The elder daughter muttered, to stand sentry barefoot in the snow. Tomorrow you will have boats of beetle-coloured silk, said the father. They went down the stairs, and a few seconds afterward, the sound of the lower door shutting announced that they had gone out. There were now in the house only Marius and the Jondrettes, and probably also the mysterious beings of whom Marius had caught a glimpse in the twilight behind the door of the untenanted garret. Marius judged that the time had come to resume his place at his observatory. In a twinkling, and with the agility of his age, he was at the hole in the partition. He looked in. The interior of the Jondrette apartment presented a singular appearance, and Marius found the explanation of the strange light which he had noticed. A candle was burning in a verdigrized candlestick, but that was not that which really lighted the room. The entire den was, as it were, illuminated by the reflection of a large sheet-iron furnace in the fireplace, which was filled with lighted charcoal. The charcoal was burning, and the furnace was red-hot. A blue flame danced over it, and helped to show the form of a chisel, which was glowing, ruddy, among the coals. In a corner near the door, and arranged as if for anticipated use, were two heaps which appeared to be a heap of old iron and a heap of ropes. All this would have made one, who had known nothing of what was going forward, waver between a very sinister idea and a very simple idea. The room, thus lighted up, seemed rather a smithy than a mouth of hell. But Jondrette, in that glare, had rather the appearance of a demon than of a blacksmith. The heat of the glowing coals was such that the f candle upon the table melted upon the side toward this furnace, and was burning fastest on, fastest on that side. An old, dark copper lantern, worthy of Diogenes, turned cartouche, stood upon the mantel. The furnace, which was set into the fireplace beside the almost extinguished embers, sent its smoke into the flue of the chimney and exhaled no odour. The moon, shining through the four panes of the windows, threw its whiteness into the ruddy and flaming garret, and to Marius' poetic mind, a dreamer even in the moment of action, it was like a thought of heaven mingled with the shapeless nightmares of earth. Jondrette had lighted his pipe, sat down on a chair, and was smoking. His wife was speaking to him in a low tone. Suddenly Jondrette raised his voice. Father way, now I think of it, in such weather as this, it will come in a fiacre. Light the lantern, take it, and go down. You will stay there behind the lower door. The moment you hear the carriage stop, you will open immediately. He will come up. You will light him up the stairs above the hall. And when he comes in here, you will go down again immediately, pay the driver, and send the fiacre away. And the money? asked the woman. Jondrette fumbled in his trousers and handed her five francs. What is that? she asked. Jondrette answered with dignity. It's the monarch which our neighbour gave this morning. And here's the lantern. Go down quick. She hastily obeyed, and Jondrette was left alone. The fireplace and the table with two chairs were exactly opposite Marius. The furnace was hidden, 
The room was now lighted only by the candle. The least thing upon the table or the mantel made a great shadow. A broken water pitcher masked the half of one wall. There was in the room a calm which was inexpressibly hideous and threatening. The approach of some appalling thing could be felt. Jondrette had let his pipe go out, a sure sign that he was intensely absorbed, and had come back and sat down. The candle made the savage ends of the corners of his face stand out prominently. There were contractions of his brows, and abrupt openings of his right hand, as if he were replying to the last counsels of a dark interior monologue. In one of these obscure replies, which he was making to himself, he drew the table drawer out quickly toward him, took out a long carving knife which was hidden there, and tried its edge on his nail. This done, he put the knife back into the drawer and shut it. Marius, for his part, grasped the pistol which was in his right foot pocket, took it out and cocked it. The pistol and cocking gave a little, sharp, clear sound. Jondrette started and half rose from his chair. Who is there? cried he. Marius held his breath. Jondrette listened a moment, then began to laugh, saying, What a fool I am! It's the partition cracking! Marius kept the pistol in his hand. Part 11 Just then, the distant and melancholy vibration of a bell shook the windows. Six o'clock struck on saint Medel. Jondrette marked a stroke his head. At the sixth stroke, he snuffed the candle with his fingers. Then he began to walk about the room. Listened in the hall, walked, listened again. Provided he comes, muttered he. Then he returned to his chair. He had hardly sat down when the door opened. The mother Jondrette had opened it, and stood in the hall making a horrible, amiable grimace, which was lighted up from beneath by one of the holes of the dark lantern. Walk in, said she. Walk in, my benefactor, repeated Jondrette, rising precipitately. Monsieur Leblanc appeared. He had an air of serenity, which made him singularly vulnerable. He laid four louis upon the table. That is for your rent, and your pressing wants. We will see about the rest. God reward you, my generous benefactor, said Jondrette, and rapidly approaching his wife, send away the fiacre. She slipped away, while her husband was lavishing bows and offering a chair to Monsieur Leblanc. A moment afterwards she came back, and whispered in his ear, It is done. The snow which had fallen that morning was so deep they had not heard the fiacre arrive, and did not hear it go away. What, meanwhile, Monsieur Leblanc had taken a seat. Jondrette had taken possession of the other chair opposite Monsieur Leblanc. Now, to form an idea of the scene which follows, let the reader call to mind the chilly night, the solitudes of La Salpetriere, covered with snow and white in the moonlight, like immense shrouds, the flickering light of the street lamps here and there reddening those tragic boulevards, and the long rows of black elms, not a passer perhaps within a mile around, the Gorbeau tenement in its deepest degree of silence, horror, and night. In that tenement, in the midst of these solitudes, in the midst of this darkness, the vast Jondrette garret lighted by a candle, and in this den, two men seated at a table. Monsieur Leblanc, tranquil, Jondrette, smiling and terrible. His wife, the wolf dam, in a corner, and, behind the partition, Marius, invisible, alert, losing no word, losing no movement, his eye on the watch, the pistol in his grasp. Marius, moreover, was experiencing nothing but an emotion of horror, no fear. He clasped the butt of the pistol and felt reassured. I shall stop this wretch when I please, thought he. He felt that the police were somewhere nearby in an ambush, awaiting the signal agreed upon, and all ready to stretch out their arms. He hoped, moreover, that from this terrible meeting between Jondrette and Monsieur Leblanc, some light would be thrown upon all that he was interested to know. Part 13 while Jondrette was talking to Monsieur Leblanc, with an apparent disorder which detracted nothing from the crafty and cunning expression of his physiognomy, Marius raised his eyes, and perceived at the back of the room somebody whom he had not before seen. A man had come in so noiselessly that nobody had heard the door turn on its hinges. The man had a knit woolen waistcoat of violet colour, old, worn out, stained cut, and showing gaps at all its folds, full trousers of cotton velvet, socks on his feet, no shirt his neck bare, his arms bare and tattooed, and his face stained black. He sat down in silence, with folded arms on the nearest bed, and, as he kept behind the woman, he distinguished only with difficulty. That kind of magnetic instinct which warns the eye made Monsieur Leblanc turn almost at the same time with Marius. He could not help a movement of surprise. Who is that man? 
said he. That man, said Jondrette, that is a neighbour. Pay no attention to him. The neighbour had a singular appearance. However, the factories of chemical products abound in Faubourg saint marceau Many machinists might have their faces blacked. The whole person of Monsieur Leblanc, moreover, breathed a candid and intrepid confidence. He resumed. Pardon me, what were you saying to me? I was telling you, monsieur and dear patron, replied Jondrette, leaning his elbows on the table and gazing at Monsieur Leblanc with fixed and tender eyes, similar to the eyes of a boa constrictor. I was telling you that I have a picture to sell. A slight noise was made at the door. A second man entered and sat down on the bed behind the female Jondrette. He had his arms bare like the first, and a mask of ink, or of soot. Although this man had literally slipped into the room, he could not prevent Monsieur Leblanc from perceiving him. Do not mind them, said Jondrette. They are people of the house. I was telling you then that I have a valuable painting left. Here, monsieur, look. He got up, went to the wall, at the foot of which stood a panel, which turned round, still leaving it resting against the wall. It was something, in fact, that resembled a picture, and which this candle scarcely revealed. Marius could make nothing out of it. Jondrette being between him and the picture, he merely caught a glimpse of a coarse dove, with a sort of principal personage coloured in the crude and glaring style of strolling panoramas and paintings upon screens. What is that? asked Monsieur Leblanc. Jondrette exclaimed, A painting by a master, a picture of great price, my benefactor. I cling to it as to my daughter's. It calls up memories to me. But I've told you, and I cannot unsay it. I'm so unfortunate that I would part with it. Whether by chance, or whether there was some beginning of distrust while examining the picture, Monsieur Leblanc glanced toward the back of the room. There were now four men there, three seated on the bed, one standing near the door casing, all four bare-armed, motionless, and with blackened faces. One of those who were on the bed was leaning against the wall, with his eyes closed, and one would have said he was asleep. This one was old. His white hair over his black face was horrible. The two others appeared young. One was bearded, the other had long hair. None of them had shoes on. Those who did not have socks were barefooted. Jondrette noticed that Monsieur Leblanc's eye was fixed upon these men. They are friends, they live nearby, said he. They are dark because they work in charcoal. They are chimney doctors. Do not occupy your mind with them, my benefactor, but buy my picture. Take pity on my misery. I shall not sell it to you at a high price. How much do you estimate it to be worth? But, said Monsieur Leblanc, looking Jondrette full in the face like a man who puts himself on his guard. This is some tavern sign. It is worth about three francs. Jondrette answered calmly. Have you your pocketbook here? I will be satisfied with a thousand crowns. Monsieur Leblanc rose to his feet, placed his back to the wall, and ran his eye rapidly over the room. He had Jondrette at his left on the side towards the window, and Jondrette's wife and the four men at his right on the side toward the door. The four men did not stir, and had not even the appearance of seeing him. Jondrette had begun to talk again in a plaintive key, with his eyes so wild and his tone so mournful that Monsieur Leblanc must have thought he had before his eyes nothing more nor less than a man gone crazy from misery. If you do not buy my picture, dear, dear benefactor, said Jondrette, I am without resources. I have only to throw myself into the river. While speaking, Jondrette did not look at Monsieur Leblanc, who was watching him. Monsieur Leblanc's eye was fixed upon Jondrette, and Jondrette's eye upon the door. Marius' breathless attention went from one to the other. Monsieur Leblanc appeared to ask himself, is this an idiot? Jondrette appeared, repeated two or three times, with all sorts of varied inflections in the drawling and begging style. I can only throw myself into the river. I went down three steps for that the other day by the, bridge of, by the side of the bridge of Austerlitz. Suddenly, his dull eye lighted up with a hideous glare. This little man straightened up and became horrifying. He took a step towards Monsieur Leblanc and cried to him in a voice of thunder, But all this is not the question! Do you know me?